Hello, and welcome to the fourth event in our Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series for 2023. To paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped the entertainment industry, both on screen and behind the scenes. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here in Stores, Connecticut, is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pagusset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Today's event will feature our guest speaker, Nikki Steer Justice, and followed by a question and audience featuring uh, your questions, virtual audience. So please take advantage of the YouTube chat box to submit questions for our guests, which we will try to answer during the discussion. I'm Clarissa Seglio, and I'm a cultural historian and associate professor in digital media and design at the University of Connecticut. Digital media and design is a young department founded in 2013, which has rapidly grown to over 350 undergraduate and graduate students and 25 full-time faculty. We have seven undergraduate concentrations across the full digital media spectrum film production, animation, interactivity, business, and the humanities at both our stores and Stanford campuses. In our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds, and we support their development, both as individuals and as professional media creators. This Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of those shared values. I'm also happy to introduce our student co-hosts. We have uh, DMD MFA candidate Tarek Raka, along with DMD motion design and animation students, Palmer Anderson and John Hitchener. Tarek is a graduate MFA candidate in digital media and design with the goal of creating social change through entertainment art. He explores the intersection of spirituality and human rights through the mediums of video games and short film animation. You can find some of his work at the portfolio link that we'll be placing into the YouTube chat. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And next we have Palmer Anderson. Palmer is a junior in digital media and design with a concentration in motion design and animation. His biggest passion is creating characters, environments, and narratives solely through visuals and working collaboratively with others to create something memorable. Some of his work includes 2D and 3D animation, video editing, and artwork for album covers and more. And you can find his work at the website link that we'll be posting in the chat box and on his LinkedIn profile page. Thank you, pleasure to be here. And John Hitchener, who is a junior in digital media and design with a concentration in motion design and animation. His passions include creating art that tells a story that sticks with the viewer and bringing to life his visual designs. Some of his work includes animated short stories, short animations, and visual design. His website will also be posted into the chat for you to see uh, an array of his accomplishments. Thank you, happy to be here. <laughs> Finally, it is my pleasure to welcome today's guest and our faculty colleague, Nikki Steer Justice. Let me tell you just a little bit about her background, but you will learn much more in the course of this evening's discussion. Nikki is an independent producer and an accomplished entertainment executive with a background in film production and distribution. 
She is currently the head of distribution for Buffalo 8 and, as mentioned, an adjunct instructor here at UConn in the Digital Media and Design Department. She started her career at 20th Century Fox, working in feature film development and production on projects including The Maze Runner and Ford versus Ferrari. In 2014, she moved to startup production company, Good Deed Entertainment, where she helped grow the company into a multi-million dollar studio. As a producer, distributor, and instructor, Justice's focus is on films from diverse voices that are designed to transform viewer opinions, influence change, and successfully recoup production costs. And we'll be sharing her links in the chat box as well. So uh, welcome, Nikki. Thank you. It's uh, it's exciting to be back, and I love following the Diverse Perspective series. You guys are doing a wonderful job with it. Great. Well, I'm going to turn the discussion over to our co-hosts and you, and uh, take it away, team. Uh, hey, Nikki. So, uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about your uh, background, especially your earlier experiences working with DreamWorks and 20th Century Fox? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, for undergrad, I studied business, and that was business and entrepreneurship was my focus. Um, and so, I didn't necessarily have a film back background. I had very commercial tastes. So I, uh, when I was accepted into UCLA for the graduate producers program, um, I just assumed I wanted to do the studio route and, and make kind of those big budget blockbuster films. So uh, that's where I first worked with DreamWorks Animation. I worked on a film called Rise of the Guardians. And then um, that led to an opportunity at 20th Century Fox uh, where I spent the first couple of years. And I realized at my time there um, that they weren't making the type of films that I, I really wanted to make. And um, part of that was because international audiences had a, a much bigger role in influencing the type of movies that were made. And we had to check a certain number of boxes in terms of action set pieces and, um, and even which, which talent had value within that space. And so there were a lot of creative limitations that I found um, and, and as a result, a lack of diversity. And so I was looking at opportunities where um, I could be working at a company that was outside of the studio system. And that's when I found Good Deed Entertainment. At the time, they were really young. They'd done a couple of Hallmark and Lifetime movies. That was kind of it. But they had uh, an investor on board who was willing to finance movies and, and support the releases. And so um, I came in in a production capacity and I was looking to get projects off the ground into production and then find a distributor. And I started getting uh, what are called producer statements. They're sent quarterly to the producers after a film's been distributed and, and it breaks down how much money you're making. And we were never making any money. Uh, every time I'd get a producer statement, the expenses would always increase at the same rate that revenue was increasing. And so um, I realized pretty quickly that that wasn't a sustainable business model. And um, I was really young and naive enough to be like, let's start our own distribution company uh, with zero experience in that space. And uh, so that's what we did and uh, started going direct with a lot of different platforms and started convincing filmmakers to take a chance on us as a first time distributor. Um, and my husband's actually found a, a teaser for a film called Loving Vincent. Uh, there's a poster behind me uh, for that one. And it was all about Vincent van Gogh and it was hand oil painted in his iconic style. Um, and it was a biopic, but it was also a bit of a murder mystery that was hinting that his death um, may have actually been a homicide. And so 
it was, it was really checked every box we were looking for in terms of being unique and different, having a built-in audience. Um, and so we, uh, we came on board and, um, that film went on to be nominated for an Academy Award, which as a first time distributor, we actually launched our distribution arm the same year as Neon. So we were getting a lot of really positive press from that. And it, it really helped us get direct with all of the platforms. Um, and the more I was in the distribution space, I was seeing that um, there was there was a bit of a disconnect that can, that existed between the filmmakers and the distributor and, and really understanding how to monetize films like so many so many filmmakers are are focused on the creative which they should be um but then their investors would lose all their money and would never want to put it into another project which um is not what we want for our filmmakers uh so i actually i ended up leaving good deed entertainment um in 2020 to join yukon as a visiting professor and that was the first time that um, I'd really gotten to take a break from the industry and do postmortems on every film I'd released. And because I was no longer a competitor, I got a ton of competitor data from my friends. And I was really able to take a step back and, and better understand what was differentiating our successes from our failures. And I was seeing that, um, you know, we would have these small titles that were made for 50K, we put in less than 12K supporting it, but it had some sort of an influencer in a supporting role that had a pre-existing brand community that we were able to tap into. And those films were outgrossing ones where we were spending half a million dollars marketing and promoting and had big name talent. And so, um, we were we were seeing that there was this opportunity for films that were targeting underserved audiences and and particularly films from more diverse voices um, that were standing out. And so, um, you know, I know in in this talk we talk about this is like one of the first times that we're seeing that um, this desire for diversity on screen and the commercial viability of these titles have aligned. And for me from a research standpoint, that was really exciting. And then uh, I was talking with a couple of friends of mine who had founded a company called Bonda and Buffalo 8. And they um, they had a, a, distrib a distribution arm at the time that was primarily aggregation. So that that's basically just taking a title, throwing it up on a platform, like no additional marketing efforts needed. Um, and they were really wanting to expand into into becoming a more traditional distributor. And so I actually presented them with the research that I had done at UConn and what we were discovering and where there was an opportunity to fill a void that currently existed, where we were able to offer more transparency to the filmmakers and really involve them more in the distribution process. And um, they were all on board. And so I, I joined the team over there and, um, and I think we've had at, at this point uh, close to 50 releases, which is pretty insane since we started over there and have been able to get a lot more data and research as far as what is and isn't working and how quickly this industry is changing, especially in this post-pandemic landscape. Uh, so... What inspired you to uh, start speaking about inclusion, equity, and diversity in the film industry? Yeah, so I would say the first time that I can clearly remember was a film called So Be It. Um, it was it was targeting middle grade audiences. It was based on a best selling book by Sarah Weeks, and she um, she would travel the country just talking about the story. And, um, and then when it turned into a film, we we're really excited and we submitted it to the MPAA, um, which was the rating system at the time they reviewed the title and they gave it a PG 13. And so, um, we, we were like, 
we need a second opinion on this because our core audience is under the age of 13. And when you give it a PG 13 rating, it can no longer live in those family friendly folders that you see on like Amazon and Apple TV. And, and so it makes a title like that much harder to discover. Um, and so I actually went with Sarah Weeks and we had a whole presentation ready. We were, we were taking it to the MPAA and um, we were giving examples of other films that had been given a PG rating like um, Jaws and Bridge to Terabithia. And we were like, this is a story about a little girl who's, um, whose mother is disabled and, uh, and she's trying to discover who she is and she has these kind of magical powers, but like what could possibly be offensive? And um, after about 40 minutes of discussions, we, we learned from one of them. Um, and these are the, the, the way it works with MPAA ratings. They take parents from like all around the country, but we had a core group from middle America and they were saying their biggest concern was the fact that two people with a mental disability had had sex to create a child. And our jaws kind of dropped because Sarah's like, I have, I have spent the last decade touring the country presenting to kids and never once did it come up. Like even, even a discussion that both parents were disabled, but let alone that, that the kids were processing that the conception had happened and led to this child. And so, um, we, we realized after leaving, they, they didn't budge on it. And when we started looking into how people with disabilities are portrayed, um, you know, it was, it, it felt like very inauthentic portrayals. And we even saw like from a rating standpoint, it was almost impossible to find a film that was rated PG um, that had and portrayed people with disabilities, which, um, is something that is so incredibly common in, in a kid's life. And so we, that was like the first big aha moment for us. And, you know, Sarah went on to write an op-ed, but we realized that, um, you know, the, the biggest way to kind of influence change and to make make it normal for children to see a more authentic authentic representation in the films they're watching is to continue championing championing that content. And so um, that that was where my focus kind of shifted. Um, and I think where where some of the challenges are because um, as as an industry buyer, you have to you obviously want to influence change, but you also have to make money so that you can keep your job. And so it's finding that balance of, of how we can tap into these, these underserved communities that are craving content that is much more reflective of the world that we live in. And uh, second question for me. Um... There are a number of recent reports uh, that shed light on the inequities in the film industry. Um, so what do you believe are the primary reasons why there hasn't been more representation of women, people of color, and older actors in leading roles um, in films? Yeah, so um, I mean, a huge part of it is is just the more traditional status quo, but um, you know, going back to my studio experience and and being on the buyer end of things for close to a decade now, um, you know, as, as much as we want to blame the buyers who are the ones that are actually acquiring and releasing this content, again, at the end of the day, it's a business and and they're looking to maximize profits. And so it starts with the consumers. Um and, and we're seeing this shift that's taking place where um, if consumers start to demand something specifically, then all of a sudden the buyers are like, okay, we need more of this content. So, um, you know, we, we really started seeing this with, um, with black cinema um, 
and like previously it was called urban content um and uh it's it's really content that is from African American voices and it is targeting an African American audience and it has to feel authentic but we've seen that budget doesn't really make a difference in this category that the audience is incredibly supportive um regardless of what what talent and names and like I'm even seeing on on some of our titles um we had a film that was made for I think it was made for under 250k and um it grossed on AVOD in the first six months close to 400,000 which like that is significant for a big film let alone like this tiny indie and so for us, that was really exciting because we we're seeing these opportunities arise that hadn't existed before for more diverse voices. And, and even to continue on that example, like we've seen more buyers arise. Like now there's there's all black and Hallmark has a mahogany channel and we have BET Plus and OWN and Onyx Collective and um, even the cable platforms are doing specialty platforms where all of a sudden they're buying for more niche content. Um, we saw the same thing starting to happen with HBO. They were realizing that a huge part of their audience was Latinx. And so they created their own arm where they were looking to acquire that content. And those have been the deals that have allowed these smaller independent films from more diverse voices to really break out. I think in order for it to cross over into the studio landscape, we need to see that support on an even bigger level where um, where people are continuing to go to the movie theaters to support films with leads that are not just white male males and that are um, are checking the boxes in terms of of again appealing to an audience that is more reflective of our cultural makeup. So um, I think that's the trend that we're seeing, which again is very exciting. Um, it just takes a while to reach the studio system because um, we're, we're seeing domestic trends are several years ahead of international trends. So if studio buyers are influenced heavily by international tastes, then we're seeing that it's taking just a little while for them to catch up um, to what audiences are craving here. Um, do you see any other uh, new trends or solutions that um, are showing promise to increasing the diversity within the film industry? Um, I mean, I think the biggest change across the board has been um, in the past two years during the pandemic is the emergence of AVOD, which is advertising video on demand. So that's Tubi or YouTube. It's, it's really anytime you're watching a film and every 20 minutes an ad pops up and the advertisers are the ones who are kind of stepping up and, um, and paying for that piece. And so for the consumer, they're essentially watching it for free. And so during the pandemic, we saw a steep decline in transactional revenue. And we saw a steep decline in SVOD or subscription-based video on demand, where they used to do much bigger licensing deals for small indie films. Now their focus is more on these big budget blockbusters. So we needed something to kind of fill that void. And that's where AVOD emerged in a really interesting way. And, and as I mentioned from that other example, like we're at the point where we're sometimes turning down licensing deals with SVOD platforms because we know it'll ultimately make more on AVOD. Um, in my personal opinion, brands are very much the future of independent film because we need a model where filmmakers are not having to fully recoup their budget. And so um, we even right now, we're actually exploring some opportunities with um, AI technology where we are building in brand licensing deals 
after a film has been completed. And we're seeing that some brands are wanting to appeal to that more niche and very specific audience. And so it's a really cool tech where, um, you know, I'm sitting right here, I take a drink from my mug and they're able to add their brand in post. It takes about two weeks with AI. We can approve which brands we partner with. And then they do kind of a standard licensing deal, which is, you know, maybe it's a one or a three year term that for the next three years on every platform, you're going to see that brand on that mug uh, that's featured in five scenes in the film. And the filmmakers get a flat sum of money. It could be $10,000. It could be a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so, you know, I think these type of it's more than product placement, it's, it's actual brand integration. Um, and I think that is a huge opportunity for indie film that, that we've been looking for, um, especially since we've seen such a steep decline in all of these other revenues. So uh, while representation in front of a camera is a key topic, how can diversity and inclusion in specialized fields like directing, writing, and producing be improved, do you think? So I think it's, we're already starting to head in that direction. And again, like, I think it really comes down to audience demands. And, um, you know, I remember in 2008, um, I think it was 2000, no, it might've been, no, 2013, um, when blue is the warmest color came out, when we were going to the film festivals to acquire content, like it was there, there was a need for more LGBTQ comp content, but especially, especially lesbian stories, um, because we were seeing that females were continuing to drive a lot of the revenue across the board. Um, and I just remember going to the festivals and seeing, like almost all of these films were through a male lens and um, a lot of them felt inauthentic and, and in many ways gratuitous. Um, and when we started speaking to audience members about what they were craving, they were like, yes, we want a story where, where it's a love story with another woman, but like, we want something that's a little bit sweeter and softer and not, not like kind of putting the, us on display in the way that some of these indie films were. And so um, we released a film called Tell It to the Bees, which was um, based on a, a best-selling novel in the UK. And it was a period romance between two women. And the support that we received from audiences was like, at, out of all of the films that we had re released, like they were so vocal, so active, so engaged. They were constantly sharing. They were giving feedback on key art assets. And, and because of that, they helped make that film more successful. And we were able to kind of show that to other buyers. And, and I think that's going to continue to be the trend where, these, these communities need to be vocal. They need to demand the type of content that they want to watch. And the best way to support is, is with voting with your dollar. You know, we, we talk about it. It's not just the film industry. Like this is a trend that's very common in, in every industry. And we, we've seen it in politics, like in 2008, when o Obama came to office, like he supported civil unions, he didn't support same sex marriages. And that was because the majority of Americans didn't support that. And it wasn't until people started sharing and humanizing their own stories. And, and we saw a new younger generation of voters who didn't see same-sex marriages as sinful, all of a sudden we saw that shift into a majority. We saw him uh, repeal don't ask, don't tell. And, and they're all politicians are just buyers. Like they're just trying to jump on whatever trends the majority are seeking. And so I think as an audience, we just need to continue to be more vocal and demand what we want to see to allow these voices to be supported. Um, 
And when it comes to directors too, uh, you know, it's, it's challenging because a lot of the, the female filmmakers that come to us, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, they'll come with a really heavy hitting drama. And um, a lot of times it's a passion project that they've been working on for years. And it's really hard because um, even for audiences that are wanting to support female filmmakers, especially like during the last two years with the pandemic and, um, and a recession, like people just wanted lighter content. We were seeing the dramas, we we're seeing the, the more serious depressing documentaries were just not being watched or consumed because people needed a break from that. And so a lot of times when female filmmakers will approach me with a story, um, I'll be like, talk, talk them through how can we, how can we address these themes and these topics that are really important to you, but maybe consider doing them through a different lens. Like maybe, maybe you approach it um, in the way Jordan Peele approached Get Out, where, um, you know, it was a time that the BLM movements and um, were, were really just starting and we were needing to have a conversation about systemic racism in our country. And there were several films that came out that addressed that topic and Get Out started a conversation better than any of them with that final scene in the film. And, and he was able to do that through a genre lens. So I, I think people forget that when you're making movies, you, you need to entertain first and foremost. Um, and, and I think when you are from a, a marginalized group, uh, it's easy to want to focus on educating and changing that first rather than entertaining first. And so I think uh, as far as filmmakers go, there's a way to flip the narrative in your favor. Um, and then the consumers will continue coming out and supporting those titles. Um, what are your thoughts about the Bechdel test for movies? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a slightly outdated concept for me, um, just because it was something that was really being applied, um, at a time where, where women were being portrayed in, in very sex, sexist ways, um, and having very small roles. So for those of you do, who don't know, there's, there's three things that you look for. Like one, um, you have to have at least two women in the film Two, um, they have to talk to each other and three, they have to talk about something besides a man. Um, and, and I think like, that's a really low barrier. <laughs> that we're setting. Um, but I think it's also, uh, it, you know, it's one that, yes, at, that should absolutely be the bare minimum. The problem is sometimes if you pass that test, it can still be an incredibly sexist portrayal of a woman, um, or it can just be a throwaway line. So, um, you know, I, I think it was good in, in showing that there was this disparity that existed, but, I'm hoping that we've moved much further beyond that at this point. Uh, moving on to your kind of personal or professional journey, um, is there a specific initiative or project uh, that you've worked on that's uh, promoting diversity and inclusion in media that you're the most proud of? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard to just think of one, um, you know, obviously loving Vincent was a huge turning point for my career and, and, um, it, it checked the boxes that I was really looking to check as, um, as a filmmaker. So, uh, and, and as a executive, um, so I really wanted to support projects that I was passionate about projects that touched upon issues that I was passionate about, but, um, and in many ways, most importantly, made money 
so that we could continue doing this and continue getting the word out. And so with Loving Vincent, we broke all kinds of box office records with that. And we had the nomination, but like one of the things I'm most proud of was we received this industry achievement award. Um, and it was, it was from the substance and mental health um, administration for its portrayal of mental uh, illness through Vincent van Gogh. And, you know, up until that point, so many people knew of him as an artist who was was portrayed as crazy and cut off his ear and so it was really great to to see it, it humanized and hear more of his story of of what we feel actually happened um there's one other title lucky grandma that um uh, we released at the start of the pandemic um that one was a heist comedy it had an 80 year old Asian grandmother as the lead it was almost entirely in Mandarin so from a buying standpoint like it had every box checked against it um but it was one of those that you watched it you forgot you were reading subtitles it really sucked you in and so we decided to do a partnership with Welcome to Chinatown which was um a, an organization that was giving back to businesses in New York's Chinatown that were impacted by COVID. Um, and this was at a time where um, Trump had just started calling it China virus. And so it we were seeing that people were no longer supporting those businesses. And that partnership alone, um, we ended up giving them, I think it was a, a, a percentage of every Apple TV pre-sale, and then they promoted through their organization. Um, and we ended up doubling our revenue on Apple TV just from that partnership. And so it was, what was exciting was we were able to support this organization. And in turn, this organization was able to support um, a really diverse group of filmmakers who had put this project together. Um, and, and I think the reason that that worked so well, even though the film wasn't necessarily cause based, um, but it was a cause that felt authentic to the film and to the filmmakers. And so, you know, that's that's a huge thing that audiences look for is authenticity in the partnerships and the narrative that you're putting out. Um, and those are those are the projects you really see take off. So. Um, you know, those are just two examples kind of off the top of my head that we're, we're particularly proud of. Uh, what was your biggest hurdle that you had to overcome to get in the position that you're in now? Um, you know, I, I honestly don't know if I had any significant hurdles. I think... I think it's kind of the same for a lot of people just trying to make it in the industry. Like it's, it's a lot of, it's that balance of hard work and opportunity and taking chances. Um, I, I think as a, as a female in the industry, um, there were, there were definitely challenges that I faced, particularly with an older generation um, and and just biases and uh, to that degree. But I actually felt that I experienced more ageism than sexism in when I was trying to break in the industry. And I think um, I, there's there's a lot of young and hungry voices that are trying to rise up the ranks. And uh, there are a lot of older executives who've been in the industry for a long time and don't like feeling that they're being pushed out, but at the same time are struggling to adapt to the changes in the industry. And they can sometimes take it out on the younger folks. Like, I think that was a bigger obstacle for me. So having worked in the industry for several years uh, and on many movies as a minority in the film industry, 
what are some approaches that you feel have most effectively won people over to actively elevating diverse voices? Um, you know, I think, I think the, the biggest thing is showing the financial viability. Uh, you know, it, a lot of times the people that you're having to win over are investors, um, who are trying to protect their investment in some way. So like that, you kind of have to come out of the gate with that first and foremost. Um, and then, you know, I will say there's, there's been a lot of people in the industry that are incredibly supportive. And I think that that has helped um, open doors for a lot of individuals who are, are considered minorities in the, the industry um, where, where it's male counterparts who are, are championing our own voices and supporting us. Like my, my first two bosses at 20th Century Fox were amazing and um, incredibly supportive of the direction I was taking in my career and um, advice and guidance that I was seeking. And, and one of them is now um, co-president of Paramount. The other one is, is a top executive at Netflix. And, and so I've been able to to build those relationships as a result of it. And then making sure that I'm in a position now where I can um, hire individuals uh, who are often considered minorities. And we have, um, right now we actually have an entirely female distribution team, um, which was not necessarily the plan. It was really just hiring who we felt was the best fit for the position and, and where, where we were trying to grow as a business. And so um, that's, that's also been an exciting piece of it is being able to support the growth of younger executives and younger filmmakers through that process. Uh, how can young creatives gain a better understanding about how to make the financial case for their work? Yes. Um, I wish more creatives would have that, that question on hand before they started going out to investors. Um, and it's something that I always tell my students. Um, you know, it's film business. Film is only half of the word. Um, you really need to think about the business implications. And it's really hard to do that as a filmmaker, not having access to the financials. And so your best bet is either bringing on an executive producer, a producer, or even approaching distributors who have access and insight to that data and can kind of help you back into a budget or help you develop a strategy that is best for you and your film. Um, you know, there's, there's filmmakers who will approach me and they'll say, listen, my investors came on board. They, they know that this is essentially a tax write-off. They're not as worried about making money. And so for me, like, yes, I want to recoup some of the budget, but they, their goal first and foremost is to grow as a filmmaker and have this be the first of many projects. And so for them, they're, it's more important to be on Showtime and some of these more prestigious websites than something that's going to be generating um, a lot of revenue. And so that's something that I always discuss with the filmmakers is what is, what is the end goal when we're distributing this? Is it, is it to use this film as a stepping st stone? Is it to generate money? Is it a balance of both? Um, and so we'll, we'll look at that and evaluate it. But, um, you know, I have filmmakers that I work with who will come in as early as the development process and they'll come in and, and be like, okay, I'm making this movie for 2 million. Here's my cast list. Who has value at that level, um, to help me recoup my budget. And again, because I work with, bond it which is a debt financing arm and we have a post-production arm we're able to see what talent is actually worth or valued at and we're able to really back into these budgets and and find ways to mitigate risk and just make the business of film more sustainable for a lot of these filmmakers 
And uh, to end off the co-host questions, um, looking back, what is the best uh, piece of career advice you were ever given? That's a good question. Um, I think to just never stop learning or growing as a person. Um, you know, I, I coming out of graduate school, you you have this false sense of confidence that you're you're really ready to take on the world and and really understand the entertainment landscape and and I think being in this industry for the last decade is a humbling experience because I'm seeing, especially in distribution disruption every few months now, you know, it used to be, it used to be every decade, then it was every year. Um, but now it's, it's really every few months and you have to be so on top of it and really understanding, um, the direction that trends are going and how consumption habits are changing. And so um, you have to be a perpetual student if you want to thrive and survive. And, and we've seen a lot of companies, especially this past year, go under. Um, and uh, in the distribution landscape, a huge part of that is because they're using these models that they've had for the past decade and they're applying it to a new model of revenue generate generation and they're frustrated that it's not working in the same way and it's not covering their overhead and so um you know it's just so important to just be really nimble and and able to change and pivot the direction of these films that that you're working on that you're releasing um, in order to stay relevant in this industry. Thank you so much, Nikki. And thank you again to Palmer, John, and Tarek for guiding our discussion, to Mike Toomey behind the scenes, making sure that things run smoothly. Uh, even for those of us who may not be aspiring filmmakers, or other positions within the industry, it's a wonderful reminder that there's uh, much more than the silver screen, uh, the small screen and popcorn uh, at <laughs> play here in this very complex industry. And that as new technologies from AI to thinking differently about niche targeting, the ways in which we hope that this will continue to open up opportunities to elevate traditionally marginalized voices in the American film industry. So thank you again for this incredibly informative and inspirational talk, Nikki. And I would like to remind everyone who's viewing this to join us for our next Diverse Perspective speaker, on Monday, April 24th, also beginning at 5.30 p.m. Speaking of film, we have Jennifer Reeder, artist, filmmaker, and screenwriter, who will be talking on the subject of That's What She Said, Inclusive Storytelling as Radical Authenticity. And we invite you to please check out the entire rich lineup of our Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design 2023 speaker series at our dmd.ucon.edu slash diverse. And don't forget to subscribe to us here on YouTube and to follow our other social media channels at UConnDMD to see all of our department's uh, great content. And once again, thank you to our students and everyone who worked together to produce this event. And most of all, thank you to those of you who joined us in the virtual audience. I hope that you are as inspired as we are about Nikki's insights. And there's still work to be done, but we hope through highlighting voices who are doing that work that we will inspire and mentor our young creatives so that together we can continue to change this digital world for the better. Good night and take care. Thank you. Uh.
All right.